The old Spanish trail almost always started in Albuquerque or Santa Fe. And the name, the old Spanish trail, is a misnomer. The now famous trail is really just a series of animal paths and Indian routes that connect important land features in an inhospitable, remote, and rugged landscape. It's waterhole to waterhole, and the shortest means around obstacles only an, eagle's, only an eagle can surmount. The Spanish route was really the path of raiding warriors, the trail of the family Travois, the migratory travel of mule deer, or the craggy descent of the desert sheep going to water at the edge of the Colorado River. The old Spanish trail was the connection of all these paths in the most direct course across the skeleton of Mother Earth's bones, where wind and water, earthquake and volcano, had blown and scorched, washed and melted away the layers of her flesh to expose rib and sinew, the very carcass of Earth's creation, bare and broken, dangerous and foreboding. Indeed, the skeletons of men and beast litter the way from one end of the trail to the other. In spite of its dangerous nature, the most delicate humans and the most rugged and experienced beasts used this route, for it was the only way. This point is emphasized even today as modern highways and nav navigable waterways crisscross the old Spanish route the Indian paths and wildlife corridors. In the desert southwest, only buzzards and ravens have the luxury of choosing their path. The mighty Colorado River and the chasm of the Grand Canyon, the Rocky Mountains Fortress and walls all force every traveler subject to gravity through a small number of crossings, saddles, and pinch points across modern bridges. Indeed, the landscape, more than any other thing, created the nature of the West. Only the toughest and bravest went on to breed and populate the land. No wonder the Wild West was such a woolly place. Iron fists, flying lead, and sparking single jacks on steel. You had to be tough to get here, and tougher to survive. Whatever the Spanish were, they were tough. Nothing stopped their quest for gold, or souls, they would slyly speak, while their darting eyes and Spanish needles winked at every outcropping. Gold came first, and souls, well, if they converted and became legal men, there were always more savages to slave until they died in the mines or figured out the secret to survival kiss the ring or bow to the Pope and the crown or be treated like a beast of burden. When a, rich, when a rich mine was discovered or found, it was amazing how slowly the preaching came, how distant the path to freedom was observed. If the secret was shown too quickly, the mines would be empty, the picks and shovels leaning on the walls idle, the pockets of the priest and investor, the conquistador and land grant owner would be empty. The church demanded converts, they demanded souls, but no one put a timeline on this occurrence. Today the old Spanish trail lies almost forgotten. Were it not for history books or die-hard treasure hunters or several dozen roadside attractions, the trail would fade away in the memories and wagon dust of time. Even though the memory fades, the trail itself will always be there. The crossings lie unchanged. The weight of treasure carts and loaded mules has carved the route below the bedrock in many places, and now erosion and wild animals keep the paths renewed. 
Billions of dollars of gold and silver bullion traverse the trail. Broken pack saddles and scraps of ore litter the dangerous switchbacks and swift water crossings. Carved in stone and ancient trees mark the path too. Hundreds of thousands of sheep, cattle and horses as well as copper, iron and turquoise came over the path. Slaves were big business too and the predatory tribes competed with the Spanish each spring, searching for those too weak to hide, too sick to run, and herded them to New Mexico and beyond, where those that survived served the wealthy, the church, and the mines. Along the old Spanish trail, and more faded side paths, those that led to the mines, arastas, and missions, which served as outposts for most mining operations and missionary efforts. Mines could be distant from missions, but missions had to exist to provide food and protection to the mining operations. When missions were distant, fierce soldiers and a cannon or two had to suffice. The cannons were strategically placed where they could cover the most valuable mines or the most strategic locations. Cannons were heavy, expensive, and very difficult to move across the old Spanish trail. The fact that so many of them have been found, and even more still, hidden by the Indians during revolts, testifies to the value of the mines they covered. Mines could be miles from an arasta, or an ore processing center, but they had to exist. No one was crazy enough to take unprocessed ore across the Colorado River or up the banks of the Grand Canyon, let alone face the Utes, Navajos, or Apaches with a bucket of dirt and rubble. Only high-grade bullion was worthy of the effort, the blood, the hide and bones left scattered from canyon cliffs and tomahawk. Mules and burrows were rare, and to waste on mere travel was unthinkable. The trip had to pay and pay handsomely. The ore crushing and processing areas were very involved. The processing areas needed stones for crushing, wood for baking and reducing, oxides, water for washing and separating, it needed kilns and sand or clay for smelting. It needed guards and metallurgists. And it needed slaves. Animals, to, animals and supplies to keep men and beasts fed. The mission too needed supplies, protection, and water. This is why the two, Mission and Arasta, were often so often found together resources, protection, and what better way to keep an eye on your high-grade ore than to have it processed in your mission plaza. Missions needed vaults to keep the bullion safe. The vault must be secure but accessible to those who knew its secrets. The vault could be a cave, a hole, or a water trap cleverly devised. It could be in the church or the floor of a miner's cabin in the banks of a river tunnel, or in a rocky chasm only accessible by rope and pulley. Often the king's fifth was kept separate from the miners and padres stash. This was not only to protect their own interests, but for legal purposes in case an agent of the king were to come calling, the fifth could be produced at any time. In fact, it's my opinion that the fifth was kept separate from all of the other treasure and that even if no one was there, that the king held documents that told him where his fifth was hidden and how to retrieve it. Cleverly constructed stone maps with document keys that were kept in the coat or cloak, belt or necklace, of the priest or head soldier. Documents must also attend the mines 
The king's fifth must be kept separate and available upon demand. King's spies or agents were often accompanied by soldiers of the crown to make sure his investment in expeditions and missions were being honored. Of course, high grading and illegal operations and secret caches were made. It's just human nature. After all, the more distant and rugged, the harder it is for the king or investor to keep track. Illegal operations were risky things. No soldiers or cannons or supplies were available to help the miner. Yet thousands of old Spanish mines or cryptic rock cairns and family waybills attest to their existence. These operations are one reason so little is known of so many evidences found by miners and fortune hunters and historians today. It's why names and dates are elusive. It's why the caches remain hidden or the mines valuable. Thousands of these privateers were killed by natives or died from injury, starvation, or bad water. And they took their secrets with them. Many historians, descendants, and treasure hunting treasure hunters believe more treasure lies hidden in secret vaults or unfinished mines than ever made it to the king's galleons or coffers. Indeed, even the legal operations faced many hardships. Sudden storms, collapsing mines, Indian revolts, early winters, treacherous water crossings, and half-broken pack animals were just as deadly as crossing the Spanish main in pirate-infested seas. Church intrigue, like the spat between the Jesuits and the crown, lasted for many years. For many years the Jesuits were exiled and brought in where they could be watched by the crown, their duties relieved by the Franciscans. But the Jesuits had their own grapevines of communication. They weren't going to relinquish their power or gold so easily. Thousands of cache sites and cryptic stone maps and hidden documents lead the way if you can uncover their secrets and find their keys. Many of these Jesuits remained hidden in the West or fled to other countries. During the war between the Spanish and the English, which lasted for many years, the Spanish and, while the Spanish and English battled, no treasure or goods flowed to Portugal or Spain. During these years, English warships and the crown-endorsed pirates, as well as privateers, roamed the high seas like sharks, cutting off the Spanish crown and war machine, starving them out, and breaking their fat coffers. During these years, the mines grew heavily laden with stacks of bullion bars and piles of loot. Gold bricks became doorstops and church crosses and chains and effigies. All while waiting for the crown to call for its wealth, waiting for supplies to come and silver to head to the coast for the galleons. Gold was worthless if you couldn't use it to buy supplies, wine, women, or song. During these years, the Indians often revolted. Padres and priests often died. Harsh winters often won over many of the mines and the missions. Some of them fell silent, their caches bursting, their mines covered over by the Indians. The Spanish waited for help and pack trains that often never arrived. The reason the Atosha, the famed galleon fleet, sought and eventually found by the famous treasure hunter from Florida, Mel Fisher, the reason it was so fabulously wealthy was because it was the mothership to the first fleet of treasure ships after the war with England ended. It was the crown's urgent need for gold and the merchant and miner's need for supplies from Spain that caused the great disaster that became the Atosha. Runners 
and pack trains poured into the wilderness to the mission and mines to demand its gold and promise supplies in return. The build-up of bullion was too great. Beasts were overloaded. Ships were taxed to their limits. The gold that made it to the coast was too much. The doomed feet, slow and low in the water, soon met its fate at the hands of Mother Nature. Late starts, early storms. Three things are noteworthy to treasure hunters today. One, more gold lies at the bottom of the ocean than ever made it to the Iberian Peninsula. Two, the law of equals says that as much gold as made it to the shore lay scattered along the trails or left behind. And third, the third is a question that I know the answer to. Call it insider's information. When the dust cleared on Mel Fisher's ocean discovery, where did he show up looking for the origins of the fantastic wealth? According to insider information, a map had been found sealed with wax in a cannon barrel that showed the treasure's provenance. Mel didn't go to Peru or Mexico or even New Mexico or Arizona. He came to the mountains of Utah, a place geologists and miners say had only fine microparticles of gold. Something just doesn't add up. The trails, the mine pits, the arastas, the cannons, and the missions, and the Spanish bones don't lie. Why is the secret of this wealth so elusive and hard to locate? Some answers can be found in sheer logic. 200 years has given the Indians who came to hate the mines and the Spanish plenty of time to hide as much evidence of the long spears as they could. They covered the mines, they threw gold in the lakes and buried the dead. They burned the missions and the forts and they tipped the cannons off the cliffs and buried them with dirt and rock. Some answers come from observing the cat-faced trees left as markers and protectors by superstitious family operations. Perhaps the mining has never ceased. Once Mexico retained its independence from Spain, its bastard children did not forget the old mines, the cached bullion or hidden wealth. Expeditions with previous surviving individuals or family members half Spanish, half Indian, with documents, maps, and waybills set out to recover what was left or to die trying. Some answers lie in mysticism or enigmas. The Mormon pioneers had their beliefs and sometimes helped those beliefs along by hiding old mines or working them for themselves. Brigham Young did not want gold found or the influence of the heathens and mining towns to corrupt his religious saints. Great efforts were made to limit mining and to keep the mines in Mormon hands. Some answers finally lie with Mother Nature herself. Landslides, earthquakes, forest fires, and floods have taken their toll on the evidences of mines and cache sites. There is, after all, something to be said for divine intervention. The Book of Mormon, unique to the Mormon religion, is said to be a record of God's dealings with the ancient people of the land of America. It teaches that the Native American Indians are part of the lost tribes of Israel, that Jesus visited these people and taught them his gospel. They are said to be the other sheep mentioned in Matthew 10:16, where he said, Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. These people are also considered to be descendants of Joseph, mentioned in Genesis in the Bible. In Genesis 49, verse 22, it says, 
Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well, whose branches have run over the wall. The legend of Quetzalcoatl, the bearded white god that once visited and promised to return, also ties into this record and this legend. In the Book of Mormon we find evidences of why a treasure can be so elusive. It can be cursed. In Mormon, chapter 1, verse 18 it says, and these robbers did infest the land, insomuch that the inhabitants thereof began to hide up their treasures in the earth. And they became slippery, because the Lord had cursed the land, and they could not hold them, nor retain them again. So the mystery left by history, the evidence is found in the Spanish Mint, or the bottom of the ocean, in ancient mines or caches, found by treasure hunters and metal detectorists. Curses, or nature itself, all lead to the scars on the land that lead from the corridors of Mexico, Kansas to Texas, from Utah to New Mexico, across the back of the giant serpent crawling from the Henry Mountains toward the river, the legend and lore that became the old Spanish trail.